Hi everyone, Teddy Baldessar here. And in this video, we are gonna be answering some of your questions. So I posed the question to Instagram, Facebook, as well as Twitter. So you guys just basically asked a few different things when it comes to watches, also some personal questions. I'm gonna start with the watches, so let's begin. For our first question we have, when are we going to get a Teddy's personal watch collection video? So I have been asked this probably more than any other question. People have been asking me to do this. And honestly, guys, I really don't wanna do it. And there's a couple of reasons why. Number one, when I started the channel, the first video that I ever posted was a watch collection video, which I think was very much something that I wanted to do because that was just a way of just self-expression at the time. And I wanted to share something that was I was very passionate about at the time, which was watches. I didn't want really anybody in my personal circle to see it. So I just decided to just post it and see what happens. I like seeing people's collections. And I think this is why ultimately people probably wanna see what I have in my collection. However, when I'm going about my journey and posting on the internet all about watches all the time, I found that when I was doing these collection videos, it was impacting my collecting habits in a very negative way. I was buying to kind of create a show for the whole video rather than buying for my own personal journey and collecting habits. I don't wanna feel like I need to buy something for a piece of content. I wanna buy something because I love it. And whenever I have to follow the format of a collection video, it just makes me feel like I'm showing it off for the wrong reason. That's, I don't think the reason why many people decide to do their collection videos, but for myself, I find it just better for my collecting habits. It allows me to answer just to myself and what I appreciate for my collection rather than trying to put on the show for content. I know the views will be there when I decide to showcase my collection, but I'm just currently not ready and I found it's such a relief to just be able to enjoy my collection without having to just make it this public conversation. I will do it one day. I just don't know when that day will come. For our next question here, we have, how can I know that a watch from a micro brand is good quality if I can't find any reviews from people I know slash trust? So a couple things I'll just mention because I'm not be able to go into all the detail here. One would be a video that I talked about recently looking at how brands cut corners. That's one thing I'd recommend to check out. And also how to tell if a watch is well-made. That was another video where I just kind of rambled off a bunch of different things that I see when I'm usually impressed with a watch. One thing I'll say right at the beginning though is going to be looking at the movement. The movement's going to dictate the price and positioning. If you understand what movement that is, if it has a Miyota 8 series movement and they're charging say $1,200, maybe not the best value for money there. Uh, the price of the watch is going to be dictated the most by the movement itself. Beyond that, then you're just looking for more of the details. And this is going to be hard to just come by photos. And ultimately, I'd recommend probably not looking in the direction of buying a watch that doesn't have any backup in the public forum uh, anywhere. I don't think that's a good idea to go for. Chances are you're not finding the next great watch brand by a Facebook ad you just randomly see pop up on your newsfeed. So uh, keep all that in mind. Some other things I'd look for, stamp versus milled components, uh, looking at just the mixing of surface finishes. Also, if they're just using rendered images, I'd ask for some actual photos of the product. That's one thing I've always noticed. Rendered images always look better than true photos. So if you can't ask, get some more details, that's always good as well. For our next question here, we had, if you had to pick only three watches for life that are under 5K each, what would they be? Now, I don't believe I could probably do this at this point because of the amount of watches that I've handled and just knowing what I'd be missing out. This would be just very difficult. But if I had to say for the general person and also where could you get the most value under 5K, I think about three different pillars. I'd go for a complication, uh, so something like a chronograph. I'd go for a dress watch and more of a casual everyday style watch or maybe a dive watch. So for my dive watch, what's the best dive watch under 5K? Uh, if talking about retail prices, I would probably say going for something like the Black Bay or uh, Omega would be right there, but I'd go with the Black Bay 58, probably just because it is cheaper and definitively under $5,000. Then I'd move into something from Nomos. You could look at their Neomatics or specifically the Orion, which also is in alignment with what I own. Both of these watches I do own, so I think that's actually on uh, point there in terms of giving you an honest answer to this. And then finally, I'd probably round out with some type of chronograph. What's the best value chronograph under five? thousand dollars I would say something from Longines column wheel chronographs well-made history there so I'd go for something like the Avigation big eye it's distinct in its design DNA and then also inside uh, getting a movement that is going to be best in class for the price category so I think those would be my choices and with the leftover cash if I could if you'd let me the person asked this question I'd like to be able to get maybe a G-Shock or two maybe a Tissot or a Hamilton just to have some fun so I like this question here and this question asked Teddy are you ever embarrassed to say the price of your watch if a non-watch enthusiast asks, how do you approach your answer? So 
This is something that has become less of an issue now that I've made my career in the watch industry. When I was first getting into watches, I recalled the times where I had something that was even over $1,000, talking to somebody and saying that you have something on your wrist, like this simple little accessory that costs that much, is absurd. And this is a really uncomfortable situation to have with people, especially people within your close circle, maybe family members or friends that you've known before you've gotten into maybe your career, you knew when you were growing up. That was always kind of a weird scenario because you're spending all this money on this little object. I have found it's always best to determine whether or not they're into it or not. If they're an enthusiast, I think you could be honest with them because they get the game. They understand that these things are expensive and they understand the passion behind it. But if they're not into watches, I think it's best to avoid even bringing up the price, throwing around uh, something like, hey, it's, yeah, it wasn't the cheapest thing I've ever purchased or something like that, a little bit more uh, you know, tongue in cheek with how you're delivering it. There's plenty of ways to go about it, but just figure out how you want to describe it, understand your relationship with that person. I think for most people, if they're not into watches, the price is always gonna seem like this extreme thing and they might judge you in a certain way. So I usually avoid giving the exact price unless I know they're into the watches specifically. Our next question comes from Lucas. He asks, Laco, some of their fleegers have Japanese movements, some have Swiss. The ones with Swiss movements cost almost double the ones with the Japanese movements. So that begs the question, is there a difference in quality between Japanese and Swiss movements sufficient to justify that kind of price hike? So I would say that there's a few things that will cause a watch movement to go up in price. Specifically looking at your uh, example here, you're looking at a Miyota 8 series movement versus something like an Eta 2824, which is going to, of course, operate at a higher beak frequency. So you're talking about an entry level Miyota versus the entry level Swiss movement. So that's one thing off the bat, three Hertz versus four Hertz. The other thing to obviously bring up is going to be the cost for assembly. The manual labor in Switzerland is usually going to be higher than some of those Miyotas. So that's another thing there. And then also you have to look at things like the parts, the accuracy, what's the range of deviation, the range of deviation for Miyota. Somebody can quote it specifically, but it's more like plus or minus 30 to 40 seconds a day. So that is usually the range there. And then with uh, ETA movements, uh, if it's usually a standard grade of something of that sort, you're typically going to find most ETA movements running plus or minus 15 seconds a day. Uh, that's usually what you're going to find, if not much better. Also, the regulating organ on a Miyota versus an ETA is going to be much different, much more sophisticated and exact with the ETA. With Miyotas, it's a little bit less sophisticated and not as precise when doing it. And then you also have just the look and presentation of the movement itself. If you're talking about an Eta movement versus Miyota, you can usually tell that an Eta is just more well done than a basic Miyota. There are different grades of Etas. If you look at a top grade Eta movement, I mean, those are pretty solid looking movements all considered and usually are a significant jump up. So for me personally, I think it depends on the movement. I think for your specific example, I'd give the easy nod to Eta, but in the case of say like a Miyota 9 series movement with a four hertz operation, tighter range of deviation, you know, it's a little bit harder to say. I think ultimately you are looking at better movements mostly from Eta compared to those base level Miyotas, but Japanese movement manufacturers, I think, do a wonderful job and I don't think should get as bad of a rap as they often do. Next question, what do you think is the best bargain in high horology watchmaking? So I think there's a several good bargain deals in high horology. Now, relatively speaking, when you're talking about high horology, that brings on a different spectrum of price that you wouldn't associate with maybe something that's a little bit more affordable. So you have to keep that all into the relative frame of mind when looking at this type of question. But I would say things that come to mind quickly are going to be JLC with some of their higher complications, like their perpetual calendars, their master collection perpetuals, some of the reversos, just wonderfully positioned. JLC is one of those rare brands where they're able to have things more at the entry door of luxury around $6,000 then move all the way up into these grand complications. So there's not many brands that have that wide distribution of spread. And I think that makes them very unique in the marketplace. Those middle tier uh, high horology brands are also great. If you're looking at like a Geo, Glass Shooter Original, you could look at Chopard with their LUC movements are also great buys. The Gerard Perigo, you could look at UN. Also, I'd mentioned Parmigiani, looking outside of the Tonda, more to the dress side of things, especially from the pre-owned side, some great buys there. So there's a lot of things out there. I think in pre-owned, there is a ton of routes to go down when you're looking at this idea. So I think you can get lost and find 
find some good uh, watches for this, but these are some of the ones that come to mind. Uh, not looking at specific independent brands because that's a whole nother animal there too. Next question comes from Kevin. Kevin asks, I am a watch guy, but I am a chief in the US Navy to be more specific. I am an engineer. So I work in an environment that is very tough on watches. In your opinion, what is the toughest mechanical watch that is under $2,500? Thanks for putting out the good content. Well, Kevin, thank you very much for your service. A few things come to mind. With the Navy connection, I think of a few brands. Uh, one, just from what is the most robust and maybe tough watch under 2,500 bucks, I would maybe go for like a U1 or maybe a U50 from Zinn with the Tegimented cases. Those are just going to be absolute tanks on the wrist. Also, great dive watches I think would be great for somebody in the Navy. Another brand that I take a look at is going to be Marathon. They made watches for the Allied Forces during World War II. I look at something like the GSAR, really robust dive watch, uses tritium, cool in low light conditions. It's just a badass looking watch. Another one that I think I'd throw in there is going to be the SAR Rescue Time from Yula Glass Suta. This is a very cool brand and a very cool watch. It was specifically made for the German Maritime Search and Rescue Association and is still used to this day. It's interesting. Uh, it has this hooded lug design, uh, a rubber outer bezel, but the water resistance is crazy. That crystal on it, crazy thick on that. They put the Cyclops on the underside of the crystal. So that thing just is a legitimate tank on the wrist and a little bit more out there. But those are the ones that quickly come to mind when thinking about your use case. So for the rest of this video, I want to look at some more personal questions. I have a few here. One is talking about my wedding watch. What watch will you be wearing on your wedding? I don't know, guys. I'm actually struggling with making this decision. I actually would like to flip the question around to you guys. If you have any cool stories about what you decided to wear to your wedding, uh, maybe you did something with your fiance, I'd love to hear that because I, somebody who deals in watches all the time, is I'm just struggling to pinpoint what watch should I end up wearing? Should I get a new watch? Should I wear something I already have? Uh, it is a bit of a challenge for me. So that is the current issue that I am facing when looking at the wedding. I'm not stressed about the wedding yet, but that is one decision I am a little stressed about. So any help, any comments and ideas down below really would help. Next question asks, out of all your blazers, which one is your most favorite? So for my sports coats, things that I wear, the one I'm wearing right now is from Belvest. I love this, it's probably my most worn uh, sports jacket. Uh, it's a travel jacket, so it doesn't wrinkle up as much. I can just you know, wear this and during travel. Uh, this is my go-to, just navy kind of blazer. It's fantastic. Could not imagine going without this thing. Also, for some other ones that I like, I like Pini Parma. Also looking at Spear McKay. Those are probably some good budget options under $1,000 if you want to get a really proper uh, sports coat. Also, you can look at Suit Supply, which I think does a solid job as well. So those are some of my personal favorites. Okay, so next question here is coming from Secondhand Shooter, AKA Will, who does all the B-roll for the channel. He asks, all-time NBA starting five. So he knows I am so obsessed with sports and also basketball specifically. And if there's one thing I know more about than watches, it might honestly be basketball. So picking it really quickly, Steph Curry at the point, can spread the floor. Also a very effective off uh, the ball player that I don't think people consider. Get him in some screens, go get lost, will absolutely knock down a three. MJ at the shooting guard, can't dispute that as being the best player of all time. Small forward going with LeBron James, can play every position, can guard every position, and can run the point if we wanna have Steph run off the ball. Power forward, you have to go with prime Tim Duncan. I think people forget between 2001, 2005, how good he actually was, uh, and also can really defend four positions on a switch if needed. Then for my five, I'm going with Hakeem Olajuwon. Probably one of my favorite players of all time, absolutely just bullied young Shaq, bullied David Robinson. I mean, he's, I think, fundamentally one of the greatest players of all time, overlooked, underrated, top leader in blocks. And also I think from a modern NBA perspective is a guy I'd love to just see uh, play in this era and probably play in any era, just because of how well he can spread the floor, run down on the fast break. He can just do everything. And I'd love to have him at the five. Good luck beating that team. So all right guys, that's all I have for this video and this Q and A, there was 800 plus questions. so. I am sorry I couldn't answer all of them. I had to make the cutoff somewhere, but we will keep doing these in the future if you guys do enjoy them. If you did enjoy it, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. That's a great indicator for me that you wanna see more of this content in the future. Also check out teddybaldeser.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the new products that we offer. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.